Ovarian hyperstimulation syndrome, known as OHSS, is a complication of infertility treatment. During IVF cycles, mild OHSS complicates about 33% of patients, while moderate and severe OHSS occur in 3 to 8% of cases. Most cases occur after HCG injection. When it happens within seven days of HCG injection, it's known as early OHSS, and it reflects the effect of exogenous HCG injection. When it happens more than 10 days after HCG injection, it's known as late OHSS, and it reflects the effect of endogenous HCG due to pregnancy. Risk factors may be patient-related or ovarian stimulation-related. Patient-related risk factors are young thin women and women with polycystic ovary syndrome are at a higher risk of developing OHSS. During ovarian stimulation, the risk is higher with high estradiol, a rapid rise of estradiol, high number of follicles, high number of fertilized eggs, and the high pretreatment AMH. However, most cases of OHSS occurs in women with no risk factors. Regarding pathogenesis, the enlarged hyperstimulated ovaries will produce vasoactive substances, mainly vascular endothelial growth factor, known as VGF. These substances will result in increased capillary vascular permeability, and consequently, plasma, proteins, and the electrolytes will escape from intravascular to extravascular compartment. This fluid shift will result in ascites formation, and in more severe cases, pleural effusion and or pericardial effusion may occur. And consequently, this fluid shift will result in intravascular hypovolemia. Protein shift will result in hypoproteinemia, and the electrolyte shift will result in electrolyte disturbance. Now, as you see, we can summarize the pathogenesis in three lines, ovarian enlargement, intravascular dehydration, and extravascular effusion. Manifestations of OHSS are related to these pathologic features. I mean, ovarian enlargement will cause abdominal pain and bloating. But take care, severe pain is not a common feature of OHSS. We should consider complications such as ovarian torsion or ectopic pregnancy. Ascites also may cause abdominal pain and distension. Respiratory symptoms may be due to splinting effect on the diaphragm due to ascites, or it may be due to pleural effusion. Manifestations of intravascular dehydration include oliguria due to decreased renal blood flow. Thrombosis may occur in severe cases. However, thrombosis related to OHSS is different from thrombosis related to other gynecologic problems in certain points. It more commonly affects upper limbs, frequently involve arterial system, may present with atypical features such as visual or neurologic symptoms, and often present several weeks after resolution of OHSS. Regarding classification, OHSS is classified into mild, moderate, severe, and critical. And again, this classification is related to the pathologic features. In mild OHSS, the ovary is enlarged, but size is less than 8 cm. This will result in mild abdominal pain and bloating. In moderate cases, the ovary is more enlarged with size between 8 and 12 cm. This will result in a slightly increased abdominal pain, nausea and vomiting. Ascites is detected during ultrasound examination. In more severe cases, 
the ovary is more enlarged with size more than 12 centimeters. Ascites become clinically detectable, and the manifestations of intravascular dehydration will appear. This includes oliguria, hematocrete more than 45%, hyponatremia, hyperkalemia, hypoosmolality, hypoproteinemia. In critical cases, manifestations of intravascular dehydration and extravascular effusion become more pronounced. This includes tensor ascites, large pneumothorax, acute respiratory distress syndrome, oliguria or anuria, hematocrite more than 55%, white blood cells more than 25,000 per mil, and thromboembolism. Management of OHSS is conservative, as the condition is self-limiting. Paracentesis may be required in certain cases, and surgical management may be required in certain cases. Treatment may be inpatient or outpatient. Outpatient management is indicated in mild and moderate OHSS and in certain severe cases. Inpatient management is indicated in severe and critical OHSS worsening OHSS and in patients who are unable to control pain or tolerate oral fluids. During outpatient management, ask the patient to drink to thirst at least one liter per day. Encourage the patient to record her fluid intake and urine output. For pain management, Prescribe paracetamol or oral opiates. Avoid non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs, as it may compromise renal function. Prescribe low molecular weight heparin in case of severe OHSS. Monitor the patient condition by telephone consultation every day to ask about symptoms, and ask about fluid intake and urine output. Review the patient every two to three days for routine baseline investigations. Urgent review is required if there are manifestations of worsening OHSS. This includes urine output less than 1,000 ml per day or a positive fluid balance more than 1,000 ml per day. And positive fluid balance means the difference between fluid intake and urine output is more than 1,000 ml per day. Shortness of breath, tachycardia hypotension, increased weight gain and increased abdominal circumference, increased hematocrit more than 45%. During inpatient management, measure body weight and abdominal girth every day. Take a blood sample for electrolytes, renal function, and liver function every day. Further assessment may be required if indicated, and this may include arterial blood gases, ECG, chest X-ray. Ask the patient to drink oral fluid guided by thirst because this is the most physiologic approach. IV fluids has a role in rehydration of acutely dehydrated patients. After initial rehydration, continue with oral fluids. Use paracetamol for pain management and prescribe low molecular weight heparin for thromboprophylaxis. Continue low molecular weight heparin until the next menses if the patient is not pregnant. But if the patient is pregnant, continue thromboprophylaxis at least until the end of the first trimester. Paracentesis is indicated for 
severe abdominal distension and pain, respiratory compromise, renal compromise despite adequate fluid management. It should be performed under ultrasound guidance. Large amounts of fluid can be removed as long as the patient is hemodynamically stable. Surgery is indicated for coincidental problems such as adnexal torsion or ectopic pregnancy. Prevention of OHSS can be performed through all the steps of IVF. During natural cycles, the hypothalamus produces GnRH in a pulsatile manner. This will stimulate the pituitary gland to secrete FSH and LH. During IVF, the function of pituitary gland is inhibited. This is known as pituitary downregulation, and it can be achieved by either GnRH agonist or GnRH antagonist. GnRH antagonist is associated with a lower risk of OHSS. During ovarian stimulation, we can start with a low dose of gonadotrophins, which is subsequently increased according to ovarian response. This is known as step-up protocol. Or we can start with a higher dose, which is subsequently decreased according to ovarian response, known as step-down protocol. Step-up protocol is associated with a lower risk of OHSS. To trigger ovulation, we can use either HCG injection or GnRH agonist during antagonist cycle. GnRH agonist is associated with lower risk of OHSS. During embryo transfer, single embryo transfer is associated with lower risk of OHSS. For luteal support, progesterone has a lower risk of OHSS compared to HCG injections. All these interventions are known as primary prevention. Secondary prevention is when excessive ovarian response is noticed during ovarian stimulation. Stop ovarian stimulation while maintaining pituitary down regulation. This will result in atresia of small and moderate sized follicles, while large follicles will continue to grow. As a consequence, estradiol level will decrease and reach a safe level, then restart gonadotrophin injections. This intervention is known as costing, and it decreases the risk of OHSS. However, costing for more than three days is associated with a decreased pregnancy rate. In such a case, consider and counsel the patient about cancellation of the cycle. An alternative approach is to proceed through oocyte retrieval and fertilization, followed by freezing of all fertilized eggs for transfer in another cycle.